Okay, with that, I think we'll get the proceedings underway. And for those of you uh, just joining us, we're just getting our SETI talk underway, giving a couple of minutes to for people to, uh, to join and sign on. And uh, I think it's time to kick off. So it was delayed for many years due to the sheer complexity of the telescope, its instruments and deployment. And we all watched and held our breath, I know I did, as the James Webb Space Telescope lifted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou launch site in French Guiana on Christmas Day in 2021 aboard an Arian Space Ariane 5 rocket. I don't know how many of you watching tonight also um, watched that launch, but it was quite spectacular and a real nail biter. Uh, we, we all, of course, cheered at the successful launch, but we had to wait another 30 days for the telescope to travel 1 million miles to its permanent home at Lagrange Point 2 on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. Finally, on July 11th of 2022, NASA announced that the telescope was completely deployed with all the mirrors completely and perfectly aligned with all the instrument modes fully operational and ready to transform our understanding of the cosmos and our place in it. We've already seen some of the most spectacular images ever recorded of stars, galaxies, stellar nurseries, protoplanetary disks, and so much more. And yet, for astrobiologists and SETI researchers, the most exciting thing about James Webb may be its ability to probe exoplanet atmospheres and determine their atmospheric composition with the possibility of discovering biosignatures or hints of the prospect of life in these planets beyond our solar system. My name is Bill Diamond, CEO of the SETI Institute. And I'm really delighted to have you with us for this evening's SETI Talks. Tonight, we're joined by two scientists from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, to tell us more about this extraordinary telescope and the new discoveries and understandings that it will undoubtedly provide. Our guests will be introduced by our own communication specialist and astronomer, Beth Johnson. For our regular SETI Talks attendees and new guests joining us tonight, let me remind you that you can post questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address as many as we can at the end of the panel discussion. I also wanna remind you, as we've already seen um, folks doing, we love to know where you're joining us from. So please use the chat function and tell us where on this planet you are, or if you're on some other planet, let us know that as well. Um, and whether you're in a, uh, a, a place where um, you also happen to have watched the uh, launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. So our SETI Talks lecture series is a production of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. It's made possible by the generous support of people like you. And you can get involved and learn about our mission, support our work, sign up for our weekly newsletter we call Journey. And you can do all of this online at our website at www.seti.org. Tonight's talk is sponsored by the many donors and friends of the Institute who fund our outreach programs through their generous gifts. Their gift to us is a gift for all of you and we're very grateful for their support. If you'd like to personally sponsor a SETI talk or learn more about how to sponsor our work, visit us at SETI.org or contact us by email at info at SETI.org and get involved. So before turning the podium over to Beth, let me remind you to check the events calendar on our web website for information about upcoming SETI talks and other outreach programs of the Institute. And with that, let's get things underway. So Beth, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Once again, welcome everyone. I'm Beth Johnson, a communication specialist here at the SETI Institute and your moderator for tonight. Again, please let us know where you are watching from in the chat and make sure you put your questions in the Q&A and we'll keep track of both of those. We'll leave the chat on for a few more minutes while you uh, let us know where you're watching from and answer some of Bill's questions. Joining me today are two scientists who are exploring some of the most promising targets for the search for life in our solar system. From the geysers of Enceladus, a small icy moon of Saturn, to Europa, Jupiter's moon believed to have a subsurface ocean of liquid water, and even to the potential for finding life on Titan, Saturn's moon with liquid methane and ethane lakes on its surface. JWST and all its infrared light collecting power is being used to observe worlds in our own solar system in the search for potential signs of life beyond Earth, and our two guests are at the forefront of the research. Geronimo Villanueva is a planetary scientist and astrobiologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He specializes in the search for organic molecules on Mars and on icy bodies. 
He is the principal investigator of the Planetary Spectrum Generator, co-PI of the Comet Interceptor Mission, co-investigator of the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter Mission, and leader for Mars and Ocean World Studies for the James Webb Space Telescope. Welcome, Geronimo, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Beth. Also joining us is Stephanie Milam, who is a planetary scientist and astrochemist who has made significant contributions to the study of comets and the early solar system. She received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Arizona, moved here to study as a research scientist and postdoc at NASA Ames, and went on to work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Milam uses space and ground-based telescopes to observe and analyze comets, providing insights into their chemical compositions and origins. Thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. So now that we have met both of you, we've we discussed this. We want you to each give us sort of like a five minute breakdown of some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Stephanie, I believe you are going to start and you're going to talk to us about James Webb and why it's important and what it's doing. So why don't you go ahead and share your screen and kick that off? All right. Let's make sure I can do this properly. So um, one of the things about the James Webb Space Telescope that most people um, already know or hopefully know is that it's um, it's dubbed the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, some key things that are really, really different and such that it's not actually a successor. Uh, one is it is an infrared space telescope. Uh, we uh, we have a large 6.5 meter diameter telescope that is um, coated in gold, which is extremely reflective at infrared wavelengths. Um, and it's an, an ex exceptionally massive space telescope such that we had to fold it up like origami to launch it. Uh, we are um, hoping to have the success that the Hubble Space Telescope had um, with Hubble already operating over 30 years now. Um, we uh, had such a beautiful launch uh, Christmas of 2021 that we now believe that we have an operational lifetime of over 20 years, which is absolutely significant for the next generation of astronomers, astrophysicists, and planetary scientists to be able to use this telescope the way that you know I had dreamed of and got the opportunity to use the Hubble Space Telescope and now getting my fingers wet with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I, I also like to point out one of my favorite facts about the observatory is that even though it's this big, it stands, you know, three stories high, the sun shields as big as uh, a tennis court, it's only half the mass of the Hubble Space Telescope. So a lot of innovation and technology went into building this observatory. And a lot of that was actually such that we could study not only the first galaxies and stars of the universe, which is what drove the design of the observatory, but also to study Star, stellar evolution, um, all the way from the birth of stars to the death of stars, to the birth of planets, to now planets orbiting other stars, but even objects in our own solar system. So the heart of the telescope is the most critical component. And I wanna emphasize that we have science instruments that were designed to primarily study the first stars and galaxies. But when JWST was first drawn on the back of a napkin at a bar, um, Planets around other stars weren't a known thing. So a lot of technology and innovation had to go into implementing the detection and characterization of planets around other stars. So even though we have this fantastic suite in our heart of our telescope uh, to, to study these distant galaxies, we also are now designed and optimized to study planets around other stars. And it's a complete jumbled mess whenever you look at the instruments themselves, but we put them in a nice tight package so that we could fit onto our rocket. Um, and you've seen a number of the images that have already come through, the comparisons of what we can do at infrared wavelengths compared to what we had with the Hubble Space Telescope at optical or visible wavelengths. So this is my favorite, most critical uh, comparison that I've, I've seen to date, and that is of the pillars of creation, showing you on the left-hand side, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope version um, at optical wavelengths, and then the infrared version from the James Webb Space Telescope, revealing new planets that are actually being born throughout uh, star formation in these giant clouds of gas and dust. 
But not only can we see inside of these clouds, we can also now see planets being born. And we released this beautiful image last last week or the week before of uh, the formal hot debris disk. So this is the first time we've actually seen an asteroid belt and another planetary system with this type of resolution such that we can now dig in deeper with the James Webb Space Telescope data and see if there's actual planet formation occurring. We really want to know what these planets are made of. Do they look like our own? What are what are the 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 intricate details of the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt of these of these fantastic disks? What what gives us that context? The big question that we do have, though, is all of the planets that we know that we've been able to detect to date, which is over 5,000, none of these planetary systems look like our solar system. And that's probably a constraint that we have just with our own technology um, and also time. It takes a lot of time for our outer planets to go around our star. And you know we've only been looking at planets in, in some of these directions towards these other objects for just a blink of an eye. And so waiting for something like Neptune to actually pass in front of its star is gonna take hundreds of years, but um, we are, we're getting there and we're learning new techniques and new tricks to be able to study these planets um, around these other stars. Two of the ways that we actually study planets around other stars is through transit spectroscopy, which is where the planet actually passes in front of its star and makes the star light twinkle. When it does this, how much the star twinkles tells us how big the planet is, how frequently it's orbiting its star, but also whether or not it has an atmosphere that may or may not look like our atmosphere of our own Earth or even any of the other planets in our solar system. We're, we're now detecting all kinds of mo molecules in these atmospheres, including the first detection of carbon dioxide. You've seen water spectrum, you've seen sulfur dioxide. We're getting really good insight into the chemistry of these planets around other stars. So it's really exciting to see what's actually gonna be revealed over the next few years as we look even harder. The other way we study planets is by actually looking at them very closely. And we do this by blocking out starlight. Um, oops, sorry. Um, let me see if I can get this to play. So what we do is we have a, a device that actually we put in front of the star so that we, we block out the bright starlight so that we can see the fainter planets around those stars. And this is a technique known as cor coronography. And we've been able to detect planets now. So what you're seeing here is the star is represented by the little cartoon star here on the bottom. And the planet itself is actually detected at different wavelengths, not only detecting the planet, but again, telling us something about that composition. But again, we need context for all of this. We really wanna know what these planets actually look like. Are they like the objects in our own solar system? Can we actually see rings around these planets? Can we actually see moons around these planets? And more importantly, does any of them look like our own Earth or have something like an ocean embedded within them? So with that, I'll let Geronimo talk more about the science that we're doing in our own solar system. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Geronimo, go ahead. You're gonna talk a bit about what we're looking for in our solar system with regards to all of the worlds here and not uh, in other distant star systems. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you, Stephanie. I mean, to, to, to tell us about the power of this telescope, and it has, as, as we've been talking about, it's, it's been built over decades, and it's such a powerful thing. It was designed for a, another era, and now we are using it, and we are actually, re, you know, we are exploring different ways to use the instrument. You know, as Stephanie was talking about exoplanets, but also we are learning how to apply them to, to also explore, you know, things in our solar system. And, you know, when you think about our solar system, we tend to think that we, we know everything. Now we, we send a spacecraft every, everywhere. How can it be that you can use this telescope today and still find new things? And this is the fascinating thing about this telescope. And I can tell you, you know, we've been taking data. I just want to show you, this is our sketch of our solar system. And this is the, the main objects and the moons are, are underneath the planets. And one of the things you can see, these are the two things called GTO ERS. These are very preliminary programs that we did with James Webb. And then cycle one is the first set of official schedule observations. In the this is all both of them programs have happened within the last year of operation of, of James Webb. And you can see we have actually gone everywhere. We have observed pretty much every planet, every moon, or the big ones. And then we've been also to a lot of small bodies. So even in one year, we already been using them at least to get a flavor of what is out there. And uh, we will, I will tell you today, 
some of the things we've been finding, some of the things are you know stimulating our our interest, and some of the things that you can do. So I'm gonna focus start now with Mars, and then I'm gonna go to two other moons just to keep the focus on the the idea of the search for habitability and life in our solar system. So, so just to give you a sense, so if you look at Mars today, it looks like a you know, red planet. Uh, it doesn't look very interesting, but Long time ago, actually, when life started on our own planet, there is evidence that there was a big ocean. These measurements, actually, we made measurements of isotopic ratios using telescopes on ground, and we can estimate how much water was in the past. So we can actually estimate that there was a big ocean covering the northern part of the planet, and it was, you know, and then it was receding over time. The escape process was blowing all that water. So Mars became as arid and you know desolate as we see it today. But when life was starting on our planet, Mars was habitable. So a lot of the search for life and habitability is, of course, set on this object, this planet Mars. So if you look at the dimensions, this is a big body of water. We don't think it was always there like, a, like an ocean today. But within the worst stages, maybe, maybe for 100 years or so, that the ocean was pretty much liquid in, a, in, a, in the majority of this place. It was, not a, it was like an Arctic Ocean. It was not like a tropical place, but it was a cold body of water. So when we think about life in places like Mars or another other place, we're thinking about very simple microbial life. You're, you're thinking about something that you have hydrogen, you have a simple bacteria or archaea that produces a residue like methane. The interesting things about these components that we're looking for are, you know, when we are as astronomers looking for things, we're looking for, first of all, the, the elements here, the water, we're looking for the carbon dioxide. We are looking to see if there's any uh, uh, complex chemistry. And then we're looking for the residue. So we can never actually detect life or things directly from remote sensing, but we can point where it's interesting. So most of the work we do as astronomers using these test telescopes is to look for these small signatures for habitability, which are the building blocks, and then look at the residue for something like life. So when you look at the planet, the problem is that everything gets a little bit com convoluted. You, if you look at Mars, you can get delivery by a comet and the comet will give you organics, for example. So then, you know, you don't know if those organics were produced by life or by heat by a comet. But interestingly, you can also have geology. And geology, we have rock, water, and simple temperature. You can produce a gas like methane, natural gas, the one we use to, in, our, in our houses. That could be an indication of geology on the planet. Also, you can have a simple biology uh, element there that is producing that residue. So the key moral of the story is that if you find a planet like Mars, which is shouldn't have a gas like methane on, a, on that place, it would indicate something could happen recently. You know, you know, could be geology, biology, or a massive comet just hit the planet. So either of the three things are interesting. That's why we look for them using telescopes. So this is the Ryan hypothesis. You know, this is what we astronomers are looking for. And we are wanting to see, is that molecule on Mars? And we use all the powerful telescopes we can think of looking for that molecule. And you're thinking, how do we can look at this molecule from afar? I mean, you may know, some of you may have some uh, knowledge of spectroscopy, but most of the astronomers are actually doing all the time with spectroscopy. And what the process is, is that when you have light, the light, you break it down into colors, you have a prism, a dispersion instrument, a spectrometer, as, as Stephanie was mentioning, you break the light into its color components. So if you have the light of the sun shining on Mars, as it goes through Mars, gets reflected on the surface, if there's methane gas on the surface, and you can look at that light, you will see the classical colors of the sun, and then you will see holes on that light of, of, of the reflected light. Those holes indicate that it's a signature of a gas there. So a lot of our work is to look for those fingerprints, those very fine. And the better the spectrometer, the better that prism, the more precise you can identify those specific signatures. The interesting thing is that in 2009, using ground-based telescopes, we detected that. And it was a very difficult endeavor. We spent years working on the data. And the challenge is when you measure a gas like methane from a planet that has a lot of methane, because our planet has a lot of methane, mostly produced by life, then you never know which of the two. And you can do all your tricks you want. You can do all the things we did but you're never sure that you remove all the uh, telluric components, right? So a lot of the value of having a space telescope, you don't have to worry about that. And this is a simulation we did of how the signature of methane on Mars will look with something like James Webb. And you can see here are colors. We can say the x-axis colors, and you can see you can lose a blip there, and that blip will be the signature of methane. And this is what we trained the telescope to do. The main idea was to, okay, can we look at that signature? And we got the data in September, and of course, I kind of mentioned that yet. We didn't publish that, 
but we are looking for that. That's, that is the driver of what our program is about. But this is just to show you like, a, a, you know, we degraded uh, low resolution mode of the spectrum that we did collected in September. We, we, it was a press release about it. As you can see, we can clearly see the signatures of water, the, the signatures of uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, you know, ice, uh, and things on the surface of Mars very nicely. And now we are dealing very deeply at that place as a 3.3 microns. And this is where we are looking for the methane signature. There's nothing obvious here, but you know, if you, we are zooming and doing all our data analysis to make sure we see it or not. That's the main driver of this work. And we hope it's going to be published within a, a few months. That's a main work of our thing. But let's go back to the solar system. And, and I think I wanted to focus on the other. If you ask me, when we look for these things, there are two moons which are super relevant. And there's Titan and, and um, sorry, Titan and Enceladus and Europa. The Europa and Enceladus are very interesting because we think there's a subsurface ocean. And we think that those are fantastic places for possible life other thermal bands and stuff. And you can use James Webb to study them, you know, and look for signatures below those oceans. And, you know, this is what our run hypothesis is. Actually, we created this movie with Stephanie like in 2016, many years ago. And the idea is that you point to uh, Europa and then you have this special instrument that can, you know, make a little grid. And we can get for every of those pixels, a full spectrum, we can get all the colors. And then the same signatures we're talking about, the building blocks of life and the signatures we're talking about, you know, habitability and things like that, we can search on that room. So, and also we can study the surface. So that is the main driver with, again, paper is gonna be soon published. We actually work with people from SETI on this. So ex exciting data sets and it will probably, we hope within one, a few weeks, we're gonna get the results out. But again, just web is, this is the simulation. We will see what we get with, with Jens web. But luckily, yesterday, actually, we published the Enceladus results. And those are fascinating. You know, we, we did the same thing I was showing you for, for Europa. We point in there. We hoping to see something, but we didn't know to spec. And just to give you a sense of what we saw, which is super remarkable, this is the size of the moon. This is the, the small moon. And this is what the images we had before. You can see there's a little bit of a, a, a plume there. There were some measurements flying. Cassini managed to fly around and take all these beautiful images. But now with Jens, where we can actually do a zoom out and we can actually see the massive extension of that plume. And we can actually measure the composition of that plume. And you, you, I mean, not only that we can actually see the plume, but we can also see a torus of water that uh, as the moon flies around Saturn, it, it leaves a cloud of water and we can measure that with Jens Mech and we can get all these spectral signatures there. Just to show you the, the, you know, what is the geometry what we did. So you can see all the moons going around what we saw, we you know, we saw that torus of water was fascinating, but we also see this conical plume of water. We can actually mold that plume of water very nicely. And then there we can see that massive release of water. And interestingly, that release of water tells us about, you know, that there is maybe a way to connect to the subsurface ocean and it's been going on. So that is the main things that we're coming out. And of course, you know, we now we're gonna go for the questions. We're gonna go and see what, you know, what how we interpret these results that we're getting now. now. Thank you so much. I'm I'm very excited by the the new work that has come out from both of you. So we we're going to talk about that definitely. But first, I kind of want to I kind of want our audience to to get to know you guys a little bit. Um, so tell us about how you both became scientists. What got you into science? What got you into this particular type of science? Um, uh, Geronimo, go ahead and and start and uh, and just kind of tell us your story. Yeah, so well, uh, my, I am originally from Argentina. Uh, I was when I, you know, for me NASA was impossible. I mean, so far away, it's, it's unachievable. I was good with computers, so I was like computers. I was hoping to become the Bill Gates of Argentina. That was my 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 big motivation. So, uh, and then I was lucky that I I was studying engineering, and I got lucky that I had good professors to, um, you know, direct me into research. And I did a, you know, we started the ozone hole in Argentina. We are in the border of the ozone hole of the, over there. And we embarked on that. And then I went to Germany to do the same thing for the, the start of the Northern thing. And then I, when I went to Germany, obviously it went to a good research place. I really opened a lot of doors and that really opened my mind professionally, personally, it was an amazing experience. And then from there, of course, I went deeper into research and allowed me to open many doors. And then I connected with NASA at the time, working on Sofia. And then from there, I came to the U.S. and NASA Goddard, and I've been there for 18 years. So 
uh, Goddard really allowed me to explore these things. You know, we, we can involve in missions like ExoMars, we can involve in James Webb. So it's really a privilege to be working in a place like Goddard, yeah. Stephanie, you you know Geronimo from, from before tonight. This is not a hi you've met for the first time. So tell us about your own career path and how you ended up working with Geronimo on some of on some things <laughs> earlier. Uh, so my story is is very different. Actually, anybody anybody you talk to at that's that's a NASA scientist, they will have a completely different story with how they became involved with working at at, at any NASA center or how what their story is. So um, I love hearing everyone's stories and um, it's really quite a journey. So I, I grew up in Texas, I grew up in Houston. And when I was very young, I was about six years old, I had a summer field trip down to Johnson Space Center. And I came home just wide eyed and excited. And I told my mom, I was going to work for NASA one day and be an astronaut, or I was going to be a ballerina. And <laughs> um, the dancing's carried through, it got me actually through college, I even had a dance scholarship. Um, but I, uh, I decided that I wasn't going to be a professional um, ballerina, I was going to become a scientist. And um, I never got a, another growth spurt to quite meet the, you know, you must be this tall to ride this ride requirement to be a pilot for the space shuttle, which now I'm dating myself. Um, but I, I knew the only other way to become an astronaut was to be a mission specialist. And that meant I needed to become a scientist. And I was very good at chemistry. And I also thought it was an applicable skill for an astronaut working on the space station, or if I would ever go to another uh, destination, having the, the skill set to, you know, be able to run experiments and troubleshoot things in real time. Um, and so I pursued chemistry. And after a number of years in college of washing glassware um, in an environmental laboratory, and also as an assistant winemaker, I decided that I didn't want to do any more dishwashing ever again. Um, I've actually vowed to never own a house now without a dishwasher, an automatic dishwasher, or a significant other that's the dishwasher. <laughs> and um, she told me to pursue astrochemistry. And so then my my whole career grew from you know working in a in a room washing glassware to now using telescopes and studying chemistry across the entire universe. Uh, that led me coming to um, SETI and NASA Ames, where I did my postdoc and learned how to run some experiments that were relevant to the observation the observations that I was doing um, in grad school. And that led me to becoming a, a scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center and um, working with Geronimo. I actually met him though, when I was a graduate student um, working in radio astronomy and um, my supervisor when I was a graduate student um, was the director of a couple of radio telescopes in Arizona. One of which we were testing some instrumentation on that Geronimo happened to be working on during his thesis. And um, he had an interest in planetary science and so when he was coming to visit, I was told to host him and take him to the telescope and make sure that everything worked. And I was really kind of upset about it because I was a graduate student. I had my own work to do. I don't want to be shuffling around visiting scientists. You know, we had staff for that. But uh, uh, we actually started collaborating all the way back then in grad school. So we've worked together dare I say, almost 20 years now. So um, <laughs> it's been a very long time. Um, and when I came to Goddard and got to, you know, rekindle that collaboration and, um, and then the science, it was absolutely fantastic. And when I started working on the James Webb Space Telescope, Geronimo was absolutely essential in supporting um, the science cases that I needed because I don't study Mars, I study comets. And um, he really helped make sure that uh, the telescope was doing the things that we'd hoped it would do and um, basically made my job a lot easier and I didn't have to figure out how to study Mars. <laughs> so Geronimo, do you, do you have a side of that story that you'd like to share with us? Well, I mean, it was, I mean, she was definitely Clinton, but I have to say, I remember when I came, so I came from Germany. I was, I feel one of my, one of my you know, one of my first trip to the US, I was excited, you know, go to Arizona, you know, all excited about going there with my little instrument. And I arrived there and then I say, oh, you know, this is another comet. I said, oh, again, wow, fascinating finding someone who does comets. 
And then I knocked to her office and she's like, what do you want? It's like, okay, this is not going to be very friendly. I mean, I, I think America is not very friendly. So yeah, that was uh, that was that way. But yeah, then then we work together because we have a lot of a lot of a lot of overlapping projects. So it's it's really great. The, the, the this this I mean, JustWeb has been fascinating for the both of us. This telescope is you know really opening a new era for astronomy. So why? How did you guys become involved in JWST? You both end up at NASA Goddard. Now you're both working on JWST research. I know that that's sort of a an overarching question for a lot of people, JWST took over a lot of our lives and a lot of our programs. Obviously, um, some of our programs didn't happen because uh, of JWST. But how did you guys end up in this particular research working on this space telescope? Um, so I uh, I actually drug Geronimo into it. <laughs> so I'll start. Um, when um, the James Webb Space Telescope had it, its big replan in um, 2011, uh, 2011, 2012, uh, the project science team was sort of taking a, an internal self-reflective look of, you know, all the things that we're promising the entire world that this telescope is going to do now with a lot more scrutiny and a lot more pressure um, to stay on budget, to stay on schedule. And um, they realized that there wasn't a planetary scientist on board. Solar system science is far more challenging than almost any other component uh, operationally for the space telescope, uh, mostly because objects in the solar system, they move with respect to the background stars. So we have to know the exact position and when they're moving and what time and how fast. Um, we also have the brightest objects in the infrared sky that the James Webb Space Telescope will be ever observing, including Mars. And that is very, very challenging. And we didn't, we weren't able at that point to go in and modify instrumentation to enable new science. And so one of my roles was, uh, or actually whoever this person was going to be, uh, their role was to make sure one, we could track targets that were moving in the solar system, but also to ensure that we had capabilities and an instrumentation um, sort of accessibility to do the science that the community, the solar system community really, really wanted to do. And so um, I was, uh, a planetary astronomer um, and spectroscopist, and they uh, they thought that I would be a, a nice addition to the team. Uh, Goddard did, and so they encouraged me to apply, and I was fortunately selected. And then I had this whole project, you know, this billion dollar project uh, sitting on my desk now, and I had to figure out not only how to be a cometary scientist, but how to observe every object that this telescope could point towards in the solar system and find out if that science case that the community really wanted to do could be enabled by the James Webb Space Telescope. So I reached out to the entire solar system community, multiple forums, multiple ways, and a lot of people were very receptive, but some really weren't. And I had to twist a lot of arms and convince people, you know, I know we're not launching for a number of years and it was even less years at the time, um, but we really need to get the work laid out now so that we're ready to go when the telescope does launch because we were anticipating anything from a four to 10 year mission lifetime, not this 20 years. So we didn't wanna to have to wait and figure it out after we launched. And so um, Geronimo fortunately uh, was very receptive when I asked him about a Mars science case um, and he helped me work through that. Uh, we published a paper on the types of science we we are expecting or hoping for with the James Webb Space Telescope. He showed you some of his his methane predictions, and um, a few years after that, uh, we were getting ready to to get our Cycle One Guarantee Time programs established and submitted, so that the community knew what science we wanted to do in the Guarantee Time programs, so that they could compete for time to do other things in the solar system. And I saw a gap. And the big gap was ocean worlds. And I was like, oh no, what am I gonna do? And I had already worked with Geronimo on the fantastic graphic that we made for the Europa um, simulation with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so uh, he stepped in at the last minute, him and a, a number of other people that he'd worked with before. And um, we were able to get a Europa and Enceladus science case established. And so um, 
he came in whether or not he liked it and uh, ended up having to work with me. <laughs> no, no, no pressure for, for either you or, or him on this project at all, I see. Um, so Geronimo, what, what did you, what did you bring in when you came in the door? What did you find? Yeah, Stephanie, I mean, it, I mean, the amazing thing, you know, when we think about a NASA center, they tend to be normally focused on mission development, you know, and normally the astronomy side of things is focused on galaxies or other things. So planetary science is very typically in situ. So we are a small cadre of people at Goddard who do, I mean, we do use telescopes with the ground and a few telescopes out there, but, you know, it's not like we are, we don't dominate, we are not the dominant force at Goddard. So when Stephanie was uh, leading all this effort with, with James Webb, it was a great opportunity for to get involved in you know, this thing. It was in the future, but we saw that there was a new uh, golden opportunity here to do great science. And I think if you ask me, the, the chances to work on things like Mars or the ocean wars studies, they are fascinating because they're all related to astrobiology, the, you know, the, the things that are, are very interested in searching for organics, water, and the origin of life, and things like that. So it was a fantastic duo, and I have to say, as the data is coming now, after you know waiting for so many years, and you see it happen, it was you definitely you see the collective knowledge of having people like Stephanie that push for the solar system research and all this team behind our teams that we have. The Mars team is huge, the Ocean Wars team is big. So these are big groups of people that we all work together many years to get these these results out, and it's paying off because definitely James Webb is gonna, if you ask me. It's definitely going to be there for many, many years. It's going to produce incredible science. I mean, we already see it with the ocean wars, and um, and you will we're going to hear more stuff from Mars and stuff. So I think, you know, it, at the moment it was more like a, like oh we will see what happens, but now it definitely is you can see the results coming out already. Very fascinating. So speaking of results, um, because we're we're already at four. Okay, whoa, all right, we're we're forty minutes in, um. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, please put questions in the q and I've got a, a handful of them now, but if you have questions for our, our speakers, please put them in there and we are going through them. Uh, let's talk about some of these results. There have been a couple major papers that came out that have been very exciting. Stephanie, yours was first, so we're going to start with you. Um, you had some water um, from a comet that's in the asteroid belt? Yeah, um, and you said it exactly as we said it when we saw it. Uh, so I'm going to share um, this present a couple of slides just so everyone can see what I'm referring to here. So we had a program. Um, all right, so I, I already kind of briefly talked about the Guaranteed Time program. And so these were um, a number of observations that were, were set up and already in the queue in 2017, I think, was when we did our final submission. And um, as you know, that was with the anticipated launch at that particular time of 2018. Then it got bumped a little bit. Then it got bumped a little bit, which for most planets or um, objects that are nearby us, that's fine because we get to see them about twice a year um, or per observing cycle. Um, but there are some objects, namely um, asteroids and comets, and if we were ever lucky enough to get an interstellar object again, um, you get one shot pretty much in a number of year span. Um, even periodic comets, um, they come around every couple of years. Asteroids are every couple of years that are in the main belt because they move so slow. Um, and then if we get a new comet, who even knows if it's going to last or survive coming into the inner solar system. So um, one of the programs that we had was to observe periodic comets. And um, unfortunately, with one of our launch delays, that comet moved out of what we call the field of regard. So JWST could no longer observe it the first year of science. And so um, we submitted a target change request. And um, the person that was leading this program, his name is uh, Mike Kelly at the University of Maryland. Um, decided that he wanted to try and see what JWST could do on one of these main belt comets. So these are um, objects that reside in the asteroid belt. Um, so this is showing you where they actually live. Um, and so you'll see uh, the, the orbit of the planets here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, the asteroid belt's a fuzzy little circle on the inside on the left and then the fuzzy circle on, on the right. Um, and it, it resides between uh, Mars and Jupiter. So this is where most of our asteroid population actually lives. 
And there's a handful of these objects, a dozen or so, that actually um, are fuzzy. They don't look like regular solid asteroid bodies. And we've been observing them for years now with every big telescope there is in and out of this world, trying to see why they had a fuzzy coma. So they looked like a comet, but they lived in the asteroid belt. And there's no reason there should be any activity of an object, a, a rocky body in the asteroid belt. It's too close to the sun for water to actually exist, water ice. Um, and then it's also uh, far enough away that you wouldn't have liquid water beneath the surface. Um, there's been results that alluded to hydrated minerals, maybe, and in, in, in asteroids, but um, nothing real definitive and definitely not anything volatile or, you know, uh, an ice actually turning into gas and driving a fuzzy appearance of, of a body. Anyway, so we thought it was a great idea to give this a good try, because if anything's going to detect anything, it's going to be JWST. And lo and behold, we detected water vapor. So um, this is, again, some of the spectra that Geronimo was talking about. So we're looking for these sort of blips, again, in these lines that are indicative of different um, fingerprints of given molecules. And so on the top um, panel, the black line that spans on the bottom, that's the comet, the main belt comet or active asteroid uh, read. And then there's two other comets um, that are, are observations that were from um, the flyby mission of the former Deep Impact spacecraft. It was the epoxy mission that flew by comet 103P, which is a periodic comet. And um, not only is the water emission absolutely booming in this main belt comet or asteroid, but um, there's no carbon dioxide. Every comet we've ever looked at with these, with access to the carbon dioxide fingerprint has a huge carbon dioxide signature. It is the most obvious thing. So now we know that there's water ice that's somewhere in the subsurface of this asteroidal type body, no carbon di dioxide, but at least we're getting some clues that water actually exists in the inner solar system. And that's that's imperative information. And the more of these objects we want we study, the more we'll learn about what the actual composition is, how much water or other gases may be present. This has huge implications for delivering water to Earth or other terrestrial bodies. Statistically speaking, an asteroid bumping into another asteroid and getting knocked towards the Earth is a lot higher than a comet coming from the outer solar system and hitting us. Even during the heavy bombardment area, the era, most of those bodies now reside in the asteroid belt. So having some preservation of water ice in these, in these objects is huge for us. And it's very exciting to understand what the distribution of water across the solar system actually looks like. And JWST has that capability. That is fantastic. And thank you for explaining it so clearly. The, the carbon dioxide part was was also fascinating. I mean, the whole thing is fascinating. It's it's just sort of a surprising result across the board. Uh, Geronimo, you had a paper. Well, it's not, the paper has been accepted. It's not actually published yet, but you can talk about it now. Uh, that came out just the other day. And this is about Enceladus, which you mentioned in, in your opening. So tell us about the research that you've done, the observations that were made of Enceladus and what you guys found um, with this plume. Yeah, so the, the big driver of, you know, when you're looking for, thinking about astrobiology, is, uh, is looking for the building blocks of life. So you want to have chemical diversity. You're looking for the carbon, you're looking for the oxygen, you're looking for the nitrogen, you're looking for the, the things like that, the John molecules. And those are stored in different molecules. The main reservoirs for those molecules, you have water, carbon dioxide, you have methane, ammonia. So these are big molecules that you're looking for because they're the main repositors for those building blocks. Then they produce more complex molecules that, they are kind of difficult to do remote sensing on them because they are too big and they are difficult to do. So you have to focus first on the smaller molecules and see that the chemical diversity. So when we, you know, for example, when you see water in a membel comet, that tells you that, you know, maybe that water is everywhere. And then when you point to Enceladus, you are looking at these, you know, cryogenic uh, objects which are very far away. And they tell us about the primordial conditions of the, of the solar system. But also, they may tell you that it's a habitable environment. And the way to explore that is, first of all, you need energy and chemical diversity. So the fact that you we saw this blue, massive plume that we were reporting yesterday, we see this huge plume coming out. It tells us that there at least there is water. We, we can see it in the plume. 
we can see the, the dimension of this massive jet of water coming out that not only indicates that there is an activity or higher temperatures at a thermal activity happening on Enceladus, which is interesting for us for biology reasons. It also tell us that that water is going to be flown away in the Saturnian system. So you have an, you know, you are quantifying that source of water. And these are trace amounts of water. So for, for example, if you see trace amounts of water in the upper atmosphere of Saturn, you may know, oh, that water came from Enceladus. If you see a little bit of water in, in other moons in, in the Saturnian system, you'll know the source. So as you explore for chemical tracers, it's always important to know the origin of these molecules. For example, I don't know, you're looking for a cryogenic place in an outer solar system, like Charon, Pluto. You need to understand that those molecules, how they got there to see if there are, you know, something is happening on the surface or they were implanted from other sources bodies. So these, these are evolutionary steps for us to understand more about how this water is being delivered across the solar system, is activity going on, and it may indicate us that there is something happening on Enceladus below the oceans. And if you ask me, if you want to send a lander to Enceladus, now I will go to the South Pole. The, that, uh, that the fact that we measure that thing indicates that that activity is pretty, pretty constant over decades. So that indicates if you go there, you're going to go to the geyser. You have to go a little bit away from the geyser. Maybe find a way to get into the ocean. So I think those are interesting things that James Webb can keep doing, and we can keep doing those measurements year by year. So that's those are exciting things about things like uh, James Webb. Oh, fantastic. Um, so all of this is sort of in a, a quest to find signs of habitability, the potential for life. But I, I know you both want it clarified that you're not looking for life, that this is not a, oh, look, we found little green men um, or, or you know, look, there's a plant unless you actually manage to find a plant, in which case, hey, great. But what what do these what are these molecules? What are these signs that you're looking for? Uh, tell us why these particular molecules um, give us a few details um, between the two of you as to as to what all of this means and what it's used for. Uh, I'll give a, I'll go start. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're, as as you said, we're not looking for life itself or techno signatures or anything um, sort of on that kind of level, at least at this, at this point in time, um, mostly because the capabilities of the telescope are limited to infrared wavelengths. And what we're looking for are these, these key molecular fingerprints and um, something that would suggest something different is happening within a given body. And so as Geronimo already beautifully showed us with his fantastic graphics, um, there's different processes that can actually alter the atmosphere of a planet. And that can be geology, that can be an impact event, or it could be something like life. Uh, we know there's molecules in our own Earth's atmosphere that should that would not exist if we had um, a, a very neutral environment where the chemistry is in what we call equilibrium. Um, it's these processes that actually throws that equilibrium off. And so if we can see two molecules that wouldn't normally exist in a nice, happy, complacent environment um, that are tending to fight each other chemically, then that's suggesting there is a process. And that's why studying our solar system, even with the same telescopes that's looking at for planets at, and, and other planetary systems, um, it gives us the, the context of what are the signatures that we can actually see, the processes that we actually know that are occurring in our own solar system, because we've, we've flown there, we've, we've sent probes, we've sent orbiters, um, we've landed on, on multiple planets now. Um, we know what's going on in those environments. And so looking at them remotely with a telescope like Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope, it gives us some context for what's happening on the surface, in the atmosphere, in the environment, but also what we can see remotely. In addition, we have molecular tracers or, or instrumentation that has capabilities to see things that we can't see in orbiters. It gives us a nice global pictures of planets. Um, we can see, you know, the sandstorms of, of Mars going all the way around the entire planet or how the, the polar caps melt and move and migrate, up, you know, from one to the other. Um, we can see how the environment or the atmosphere of Titan is dynamic, Jupiter, um, and that tells us a lot. So when we look at a planet around another star, 
we can we can determine how many how thick the clouds are how thick the actual atmosphere is how hot the atmosphere what it's made of and we can start looking for these little process signatures suggesting that something else is happening it may not be obviously something like life but at least it gives us a short list of objects so in future missions we know where to really hone in and put our energy towards and look at those objects much closer with different telescopes different techniques um, and maybe even some crazy day uh, sending probes or whatever elsewhere in the universe to to try to explore those regions in geronimo Yes, yeah, exactly. What, what Stephen said, the idea of this is mostly to direct where our searches are in detail. So, for example, you know, we, one of the big drivers that happening right now in the inner solar system is, for some of the Mars sample return, or we want to go to Enceladus and send a, or a lander there. So, if you want to go to get a sample from Mars, where would you go? And the way you can direct those things is by doing these things. You know, for example, if you find a site on Mars that is releasing methane, then I would probably go there and. Look, what well, some of the findings that we did about methane, even though they are very complex and there was a lot of controversy about the system of methane on Mars, that, that motivate us where to go. And, you know, the, it's pretty clear a lot of the searches for life on Mars right now are on the subsurface and everybody's looking for that aquifer below the surface. So, you know, the idea of the, the idea of this remote sensing idea is to direct, uh, as Stephen said, honing where you want to go. Instead of going randomly anywhere on the planet, you know where you want to go. This is this more chemical diversity, the more chances you're going to see something. So I think, you know, the idea that we have this massive telescope up there that we can point and, and, and cat, catalog, catalog all these um, all these complex molecules. And we are just talking about, you know, methane, uh, CO2, water. Tell us about the chemical. But there are other molecules that we're also searching. They are within the same band pass, And we're also searching for them. So the potential for many discoveries are there. I want to get to some of the audience questions, um, and this one sort of struck me as, as a good follow up to what you guys were just talking about. Um, you're talking about different molecules that you're looking for. Do you consider any of the any are there any molecules that you would say are definitive signs of life or is it going to have to be sort of a combination of molecules? Are there anything is there anything that's that's unique to life that we would say, ha, that's a smoking gun? Or can we find a more terrestrial non-biological explanation for most of the things you're looking for? I, I, can, I can say quickly, I mean, Stephanie, you can. So, I mean, the, the thing I can say is always, as Stephanie was saying, it's about chemical imbalance. You're looking for things, for example, if you find methane in Pluto, you didn't find life on Pluto. It's just, is there because primordially we're given a lot of methane. So the idea of chemical, you're looking for molecules that should not exist. And methane should not be on Mars today because it gets destroyed in the other things. So the idea is to look for molecules which shouldn't be there, but a chemical imbalance. And you know, the idea is to look for chemical diversity. If you ask me, it's very difficult to find smoking gun, molecularly speaking. Actually, even if you send a rover and it's doing you know, mass spec in complex molecules like this, you will have a hard time. There are ways, you know, a lot of the work that we can send to Mars that you can find structures. So most of the work, for example, when look, you know, the rovers are looking for chemical complexity. They're looking for patterns on chemical structures, which are more perhaps inclined to biology. But it's very difficult to, you know, quantify those things with, especially with a telescope. And I'll I'll add just another little aside to this. So we're even trying really hard to find a smoking gun and things like meteorites where we can analyze them in much more sophisticated labs which with better sensitivity um you know we have instrumentation that are you know synchrotrons that are as big as a whole city that can you know study these these tiny little rocks and in, in very high precision and even in those even when we found things like amino acids or nucleobases the chemistry can always be explained abiotically a lot of the amino acids that we find in, meteorite, in meteorites aren't amino acids that we find in life itself here on Earth. It is provocative, though, because it suggests that maybe that chemistry is actually evolving to a state where we have bigger building blocks to initiate something like life on a planetary environment. Um, but the detection of an amino acid in a planet around another star we're pretty far from that capability right now um, and probably ever. 
just because that type of signature, those types of molecules, they're so complex. There's so many atoms that are put together to make this, this big molecule, macromolecule, that finding it in, with a remote sensing capability is a, is a huge challenge for us. And even in a laboratory, we're talking parts per billion, parts per trillion types of abundances. And what we can even detect on Mars remotely with JWST, we're nowhere near a part per trillion type of sensitivity for something as, as simple as methane. So um, if we start getting more and more complex and have three or four carbon atoms and multiple oxygens and nitrogens, um, that just makes the, the detection limit even harder and more complex. So um, the smoking gun thing is, is a very hard sell um, for, for an astronomer that's doing remote sensing of an object where we're, we're doing as best we can to, to detect water in an asteroid. So <laughs> um, it, there's challenges for sure. So I think it's it's looking for this chemistry that's a little bit different and trying to figure out why it's different and what could be causing it. So, so far we've been talking about uh, looking at our own solar system, but obviously JWST has been looking at exoplanets as well. You mentioned that at the beginning. Have we found any um, interesting targets so far for uh, JWST as far as exoplanets are concerned in the realm of, of making them targets for astrobiology searches? I can I can mention yes. So the 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 thing about the most of the plants that we we with the interest and in, Stephanie was showing that there are these plants which are tidally locked. They're very hot because they are the way we detect them. But you know one of the drivers, a lot of the big emphasis is on these terrestrial like planets or plants which are our size and they are a little bit uh, colder because they are around M dwarf stars. Uh, and those those plants are are more closer to what we think about habitability. So a lot of the emphasis that we're trying to do is to measure them. They are very challenging for even for James Webb because the atmospheres are very compact. So when you look at a transit spectroscopy, those transits have become very, very compact transits and they become very difficult. Yet uh, there was this detection of CO two, and people are looking for other complex, other other complex, other molecules like methane and water and so on. So. There may be a chance that we may be able to detect more complex molecules, but if you ask me, if you can detect a, a lot of chemical diversity in a planet, and we are lucky to do that, that definitely makes a lot of interesting studies about chemical imbalances. As we've been talking about, the idea is to see why those imbalances are happening. It's like oxygen in our planet. Is, it shouldn't be here or in this proportion with ozone. So when you find it, when you find chemical disequilibrium of that form, our diagnostic of maybe something happening. But again, as Stephanie was mentioning, there are geological process, so we call them false positives, and it's part of the big research. But if you ask me, I will keep searching. You know, the more plants we find, the more we understand the chemical diversity, the better we can just say, okay, if I had to go to a planet, at least I go to those that they have some chemical diversity. Um, oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, I was just going to say my favorite exoplanet observation to date has been the one with absolutely no molecular signature. <laughs> Uh, it's arguably the most uh, flat spectrum anybody's ever observed towards the planet. Um, and uh, there's a lot of humor that goes around the community about it, but um, they detected nothing, no water, no methane, no carbon monoxide, no carbon dioxide um, at a very sensitive level. And this is one of these uh, terrestrial planets that's in the habitable zone. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty dead planet. It's probably what, what Mars would look like for us. <laughs> Uh, that brings me to sort of another audience question here. Um, you mentioned that you you observe this uh, exoplanet at a very sensitive level. When you talk about JWST, how sensitive, how accurate are we talking about these observations? What sort of level are we getting to here? These are these are you know these are incredibly precise measurements. This is what we call parts per million. So you actually can detect sunspots on the stars. And you know, in some of the, a lot of the work actually Stefan was mentioning, that what we, we are reaching the moment that we are already investigating if we, we're seeing some sunstorms on the star than on the planet itself. So I think it's incredibly precise, the level of thing. And I think this is the beautiful thing about being in space. You can have a massive telescope on ground, but all the elements of being on ground makes the measurements very difficult. Being in space with such a big telescope, Cryo cool, it it's, allows this incredible sensitivity of parts per million. Yeah. yeah. And I I will show one of my favorite examples. Um, so this is a 
fantastic one. Let's see, share, sorry. I have to share first. <laughs> so um, the Hubble telescope uh, was known for doing uh, the ultra deep field. And um, Hubble uh, spent a lot of time, the director spent his own time that he had to allocate as he wished to just sit and stare at blank sky for hundreds of hours. And um, one of which is known as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And so the total time accumulated was about 11.3 days worth of time um, staring at one spot in the sky. And we took a glimpse at it with the James Webb Space Telescope for um, not even a full day. And they actually operated at the same wavelength. Uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field had was at the near infrared wavelengths. So Hubble did go a little bit overlap with JWST. Um, and you can already even see in the blinking of this image, the capability of JWST in um, a 10th of the time, basically just to get something even better, even more spectacular, even deeper than what the Hubble Space Telescope could do at these wavelengths. So um, we are um, incredibly sensitive and it's only revealing itself every single day. Um, we get to see new images, new deep fields, uh, new discoveries being made even in our own solar system with capability that we've never had before. That's that's amazing. And laying it out right there is is really fascinating. Um, I'm going to take one last audience question here, um, kind of because it was going along with where I was going to go. Um, they said, I, I love this. I know JWST science is exciting, but what's next? What is the next type of telescope we should plan for to get us to the next level of astrobiology research? I, I can go, yeah. So we are working actually with Stephanie on, on different projects. So right now we're working, we have we have Roman. This is the next frontier. This is already happening. And we have a lot of exciting things with Roman. But I think we are also thinking about the future beyond Roman. And that then we have things that, you know, we have things about things like like a, like a Lubar or Havex or Habit of Warsaw. So there's a huge observatories, a lot of collecting area. We're also thinking about an infrared like origins telescope that it, it can do the thing we're talking about the infrared, but even, even a broader wavelengths and collecting area. So yeah, so there is a lot of things that we're thinking. It's all about you know spectral instrumentation. Most of the things you hear today are about spectroscopy. So we are we are biased to a spectroscopy. We think all these chemical tracers are best land with the best instrumentation. So the infrared for us is very powerful. The high resolution and the high collecting area are the things that we really need to make these measurements happen. And I think we are going to be working for at least probably till we are retired from science and the future telescopes that I think they're probably going to be in 2040 or so. It's job security. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I have I do, I will have one last question, but I'm going to let Bill take over for just a few moments here. No, go ahead and ask your ask your last question, Beth. Ask my last question. I've got right. one too. Oh, of course you do. Uh, here we go. Um, all right. So, what does, in your opinion, this science mean to you, to science overall, and and to humanity at the end of the day? Well, I'll start. I guess. Um... So I think what we ultimately are doing is we're we're in this realm of, you know, the big questions that humanity is always asked, you know, are we alone? How did we get here? Um, what's out there? And by searching in a very systematic manner, understanding our local environment, um, so Earth itself, how it's evolved um, to planets that have a sort of resembled history of Earth, so Venus, and or Mars and understanding how they've evolved with time, um, even since the formation of the solar system, understanding what the composition of, of the material that created the planets in our solar system, how that formed, how that evolved, how it gets processed. Every time a comet comes around the sun, you know, it's getting a sunburn, it's getting a little bit cooked. Um, so when we're actually observing comets, are we seeing that, that true pristine, um, you know, uh, fossil material from when the solar system formed, or is it a little bit cooked? Is it is it a steak, a leftover steak in the back of the freezer that's already been on the grill, or you know, is it the fresh cow? 
And then we can compare that and understand sort of that evolutionary process in general by, by looking at other systems, planetary systems that are forming, um, studying planets in other planetary systems, um, study, studying star formation and the chemistry that's happening in that star formation and evolution. As a star dies, what does that mean? Does it annihilate all of the planets that were around that star and completely disintegrate them into nothing but atoms and dust? Or is there some molecular remnant that actually survives and gets carried on to the next new star forming region or new planetary system? So uh, the discovery space is out there and, and all of this is, you know, I, I'm a chemist, so following the chemistry is sort of what I do. But it, it also means that, you know, if, if we find things like amino acids and meteorites, that means that some of that preliminary material from the early solar system when all of the planets were still forming, we didn't have oceans on Earth. We didn't have, um, you know, the satellites around uh, our giant planets. All of this is actually little bits of information that's telling us that that chemistry was much more evolved than what we can see remotely. And so if we can put that into context of other planetary systems that are forming, that means that that chemistry is ubiquitous. It's going to be the same in any one of these systems which suggest that maybe these seeds, these prebiotic molecules, this simple chemistry that maybe collectively become something more complex can actually rain down on other atmospheres, other terrestrial planets, and maybe that's gonna initiate life somewhere else. And that's the kind of you know, path that we like to follow to see if we can follow that evolution and understand how the chemistry evolves, how biology could evolve and potentially how life could evolve. Wow. Thank you. Geronimo, do you have anything to add to that amazing no, that was, answer? That was inspiring. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> <Stephanie>. <laughs> All right, Bill, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Beth. And thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Geronimo. That was absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that what's so exciting about James Webb, about the work that both of you are doing and your many colleagues, um, is, you know, SETI as an endeavor, looks for signs of, of technology that nature doesn't produce as a proxy for life and intelligence. It's sort of a definitive um, technique should it yield results. Astrobiology, which we also undertake at the Institute, um, really looks for life in its most basic forms. And I think the study of life in, in or the potential for life in our own solar system is so fascinating because if we find examples of life in different parts of our own solar system, particularly with a unique biogenesis, you know, to me that suggests in terms of the question of are we alone in the universe is sort of game over, right? It, it, uh, I, I have a quote that I'm, I'm known for saying that um, I think someday I will be born out on this, but my, my quote is that I think the most remarkable thing about life may be that it's not so remarkable after all, <laughs> that life may be as natural a phenomenon and as natural a byproduct of the formation of planets as, as the formation of planets is a natural byproduct byproduct of the birth of, of stars. So who knows? But it's so exciting, uh, the work you're doing. And, um, you know, you both did such wonderful jobs explaining what you're doing, explaining the science, explaining the capabilities of James Webb. Uh, Geronimo, I thought your, your visualizations and animations were fantastic. I mean, spectroscopy is such a powerful tool and technique. And uh, and yet, you know, it's not the most straightforward thing for people to to understand how it works. But I, I thought your animations and visualizations did a great job of explaining spectroscopy and how much we can understand uh, about you know even distant worlds and environments through that technique. So, uh, and again, you you both just did a, a spectacular job. I did have one question that I'm going to take advantage of my my spot here at the end to ask you. Um, it's a question, you know, I've, I've been working actually with with Jim Green, who's the you know former um, chief scientist at NASA. He's now retired and he's doing some talks and we were um, going over some of the different ways of looking for life in the universe, you know, in situ sending instruments to places or remote sensing like James Webb or SETI, you know, looking for signs of technology. And in terms of James Webb and its ability to probe exoplanet atmospheres, about how far out in light years from you know, our own solar system can that technique be effectively used? And, uh, and if you know the answer to this, uh, you know, roughly how many candidate planets might there be in that parameter space uh, for James Webb? 
Yeah, so that's I can I can tell is is that's the toughest question. So we always normally I mean I, I'm not an expert, but I, I can say that normally we always focus on the fifty parsecs. Uh, you know the that is kind of our our but it's still within our confines. And normally, you know, normal, normally that that is a definition where we can do spectroscopy at, at a certain sensitivity that we can see molecules, perhaps. But then, for example, when you're thinking about something like coronography, even with the future observatories, even if we build habitable worlds in 2040 something, we are heavily focusing on the near neighborhood, which is even shorter, maybe 20 parsecs or even 10 parsecs. And then your number of candidate plans for doing that it becomes very restrictive. But yeah. that's why. We are working a lot on the future surveys. I mean, we, you know, we have a right now, we are every time we learn more about planets, we are getting more sensitive to do radio velocity, but also transient spectroscopy. So getting bigger surveys, uh, more coverage in the sky, so we can uh, increase this, the survey of more uh, available plants. So there's a lot of hope that we can detect more plants and include that survey. But yeah, it's going to be restrictive in, in the amount of photos we can get. And also the the you know coronography requires certain distances so you can mask the light in the right way. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much, Stefan. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, but I yeah, I just wanted to say that I I think your first point was actually um, why we do what we do in parallel in the planetary science division, and that's we're doing exploration as best we can closer to home, because um, once we find that first evidence that is the smoking gun. And it means that it's gonna give us a lot of insight into what we should or could be looking for elsewhere. Right now, we, we're we're very biased on what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for Earth 2.0. We want sure. water, we want methane, we want carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Um, but who's to say that's the environment that we will, we will actually have life in? So um, I think the diversity that we have across the solar system and the environments um, are, is going to be very revealing. And, you know, we even find that here on Earth. So um, only time will tell, but uh, we're definitely doing the best we can to, to enhance and enable exploration across the solar system, but also peer deeper into planets around other uh, stars. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you said earlier, as a chemist, you know, you follow the chemistry, right? So bankers and investors follow the money, chemists follow the chemistry, biologists follow, follow the biologists, physicists, and, and spectroscopists follow the light. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but I, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Well, again, it was really, uh, really marvelous. We had a, an interesting question that has popped up a couple of times. Somebody named Utsaf, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, has asked a few times, what science groups are needed for the study of, of astronomy? I mean, it's a, it's a great question from my point of view. Um, you know, the answer is a little bit like a cross section of the science at the SETI Institute. We have over 100 scientists and, and affiliates at the Institute who cover 23 separate disciplines of science. And, and the same is true, of course, for NASA and elsewhere, you know, from chemistry, physics, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, biology, microbiology, planetary science, geology, geophysics, you know, on and on and on it goes. And, and um, you know, when you're when you're trying to answer a question as big and profound as as, you know, is there life elsewhere in the universe, you need all aspects of the natural sciences and probably some of the unnatural sciences and uh, uh, and humanitarian sciences to answer these questions. So it is a good question, but there isn't there isn't one part of, of the natural sciences that isn't exploited in some way in this pursuit. So uh, but lots of great questions from the audience. And we did have uh, people as as normally from from all over the place um, and uh, watching us tonight um, in terms of countries. We had folks from Mexico, Canada, the US, Australia, India, Japan, Spain, Argentina, probably Geronimo, some of your, your family, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and in Chile, someone who was actually from watching from the Atacama, and uh, I've been to the Atacama with our own NASA Astrobiology Institute team, um, and I have to say it's one of the most spectacular and, and stunning and otherworldly um, places on, on this earth. Um, we've had friends from Brazil and Greece and the United Kingdom and from the United States all over the place, California, Arizona, Hawaii, Indiana, New York, Texas. Actually, somebody from Texas said they were watching from Houston and there wasn't a problem, which was good. Um, Colorado, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Washington, Illinois, Vermont, Oregon, Minnesota, New Mexico, Wisconsin, Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana. And if I didn't mention where you're watching from, it's probably because you didn't say. So next time, do let us know where you're watching from. We always like to understand 
who's watching and, and um, where you're from. But uh, before closing tonight's event, just a reminder again that the SETI Talks is a production of the SETI Institute. We're a nonprofit research and education institution, and our mission is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe and to share this knowledge with all of you, with the whole world. Our SETI Talks lecture series is supported in part by donations from the public, from friends of science like you. We bring these lectures and other events to you at no cost, but we're always grateful for any kind of donation that allows us to continue bringing the stories of extraordinary science and exploration to you. So again, visit us at SETI.org for more information about that. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can make a donation if you're inclined or just peruse our website where there's loads of stories and information about the wide ranging and extraordinary work we do every day to answer one of science's most profound questions, are we alone in the universe? So thanks again to all of you for being with us tonight. And thanks again to our moderator and tonight's amazing guests, also want to thank Rebecca, Lee, Jasmine, Frank, Simon here at the Institute, all of whom make our SETI Talks series possible. And all our SETI Talks lectures and panel discussions are on our YouTube channel, along with vast amounts of other amazing material. So do take an opportunity to uh, visit the SETI Institute's YouTube channel. You'll find all kinds of, of amazing talks here. And again, this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel in a matter of days. Remember that the work we do at the Institute is for all of humankind. Don't just stand by and watch. Come on and join us at SETI.org and get involved. The search for life beyond Earth is a journey of ultimate discovery. We invite you to come along. We thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.